in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 27, it says this, And beginning at Moses, and in all the prophets, he that is Jesus, expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let's pray. Our gracious and ever-blessed God, we thank you that we come to you in and through that wonderful and worthy name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that we do not come to you through our own name. We do not come to you through any other name, for surely you would not hear us. But, Father, we thank you that we come to you in and through the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you that his name far surpasses any other. We thank you that his name is above any other name. And we thank you that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Father, we do praise you for the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. We worship your dear Son. We praise you for your great, great, glorious Son, the Lord Jesus. We worship him. We thank you that he's fully God. And we thank you that he became fully man. Father, we praise you that he is our answer. We thank you that we look to him. We praise you that we have such a great saviour, even the Lord Jesus. Father, we confess before you that we are sinners. We confess before you that we've done those things which have displeased you and thought those things that are dishonourable to you and acted in ways that displease you, said words that displease you. Father, we do pray that you would forgive us. We thank you that we have such a great, great, glorious Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have such a high priest who came to represent us on the cross when he died for our sins. We thank you that he was delivered up for our offences and was raised again for our justification, for being accepted before you and having all of Jesus' righteousness credited to our spiritual account when we place our faith in Christ. Father, we praise you for the great gospel of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you truly orchestrated it. We thank you that you designed it. We thank you that you entered into that covenant with your Son. We thank you that you gave people to Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus died, lived, died and rose again and ascended and, and intercedes for those people. We thank you that Jesus is in heaven now, interceding for us at your right hand as our high priest. Father, we give you much praise. We worship you for the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray that we would know more of him. May he increase and may we decrease. May we know more of our Saviour. And also we would not forget the vital ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he seals these truths concerning you and your son to our hearts. We thank you that we, when we place our faith in Christ, have the down payment, the guarantee of that earnest, of that inheritance. Lord, we praise you for the Holy Spirit. We pray that he would seal the truths of Jesus to us. Father, we pray for him to be with us. He will convict us of sin and draw us to the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for that effective work of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray that as we call upon you at this time, as we have this time of worship, we pray for your blessing to be upon it. We dare not, Lord, venture forth without you. Father, we know that um, Jesus said, unless without me, you can do nothing. Father, unless we have Jesus with us, it's in vain. Father, we pray that we would ever look to you. Father, we pray that Jesus' presence would be near us. Father, may we learn, but may it not just be head knowledge, but may it be heart knowledge as well. May we grow in our understanding. Father, we pray that we'd come to Christ. Be with us, O Lord, as we proceed. Lord, we pray for your grace and for your favour to rest upon us. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus, our great mediator, that we pray this prayer. Amen. Well, we've been looking at what the Bible is like. And today, I've got a visual aid to show you, I'm sure, 
you've all drunk one of this. <laughs> it's a glass of milk. I'm sure you like a glass of milk. I'm sure you do. Well, maybe you, uh, adults, you have tea or coffee. And probably some people take it black, of course. Some people have a dairy intolerance, so they can't have milk in their tea or coffee. But maybe you put tea, milk in your tea or coffee. Milk, we use milk all the time. Maybe you have cereal in the morning. Maybe this morning you had cereal for breakfast and you put milk in the cereal. Maybe you have porridge and you put milk in with the oats. We have milk a lot, don't we? Particularly babies. Yep, you had milk when you were a baby. That was your staple diet. And as soon as babies are born, they cry out for milk. And when they're hungry and they want milk, they cry out for milk. They have a strong desire for milk. They really want milk. They have a strong craving for it because it nourishes them. In fact, that's all they can have. You don't give a baby steak and chips, do you? And give babies solids. What do you give babies? You give babies milk. Now, did you know the Bible describes itself as like milk? In a book called 1 Peter, chapter 2 and verse 2, it says this. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby. As babes desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby. Just as a baby craves for milk, Peter and God through Peter tells us in God's word that we're to crave for the pure milk of God's word. Pure milk. Not that there's mixed with other things, but it's pure milk. That's pure, it's going to do us good. Not the, not the word mixed with different errors, but the pure milk of the word. So just as milk causes us to grow, the Bible causes us to grow. In fact, it's always a good state when a baby cries out for milk. It's a sign of health. It's a sign that they're healthy. They want milk. And it's a sign of spiritual health when there's a desire for God's word. In fact, there's got to be a worrying sign when there's not a desire for God's word. I and mean, we don't really want by the Bible. But we must be like babies who want milk that will nourish us, that will, that will bring about growth in us. It's going to be the Lord through his word that will build us up. So next time you see milk, next time you have milk, maybe in a pure glass, just like, just like this. Or maybe it's in cereal or on tea or coffee. Remember, the Bible is like milk. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. We're going to read from this Bible. And our Bible reading is taken from John's Gospel. John's Gospel and it's in chapter 19, John chapter 19, beginning to read at verse 25 to the end of verse 37. John chapter 19, beginning to read at verse 25 to the end of verse 37. Let's hear the word of God. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. 
and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And another, again another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Let's once again turn to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to pray a prayer of intercession. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father and our gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for the mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the greatness of him. We thank you for your precious word. And Father, we do pray that in a few moments as we hear a message from it, that you would speak to our hearts. Once again, Father, we bring this whole issue of this world crisis to you. We pray for this epidemic, this pandemic that has swept across this globe. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would stop it but cause us to teach us the lessons that you would have to teach us through this. Father, we really pray that we would learn many lessons from it. Help us not to miss the things that you would teach us through this time. Help us to look to you. You are our rock. You are our fortress. We lean on you. You are our God. Father, we especially pray for those who are ill, that you would cause them to have a speedy recovery. And Father, we pray for those who are mourning the loss again of, of loved ones who've passed into eternity over this last week. Pray, Lord, that you would be near to them and ongoingly for those family members who've lost loved ones. Father, we pray again for those on the front line that you would be near to them. Be watching over them, Father, and help them. And also we pray that each of us will consider our latter end Father, we pray that we consider eternity. Lord, we pray that we consider spiritual things. Consider Jesus. May we look to Christ. May we know our sinfulness and know the wonder and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord. We pray that you would forgive us our sins. And we especially pray for local churches at this time. For fellowships, Lord, do we know that will be struggling through these events. We pray that you would be near to them and give them grace and help and strength and blessing. We pray that you would watch over them and cause them to know you. Oh, Father, we pray that churches would not dismantle as a result of this. We pray that sheep would not wander. We pray that flocks would be kept close together. We thank you, Lord, for the use of technology. We know, Lord, that it's a poor imitation of meeting together lord we would love to meet together father we pray that soon we would do that lord we won't need to have this video lord we won't need to have that because we meet together with with brothers and sisters in jesus around your word father we pray that that would happen soon and very soon we'll be brought together and we'd worship you in a, in a more joyous way father we pray for grace but in the meantime, give us grace, give us patience, Lord, give us you. We pray that you would help us. And so we're looking to you for this message. Please help me as I speak. Please help anyone who's listening to this to benefit. Lord, for maybe we've never cried out to you before. 
we pray that we would say, what must I do to be saved? And there believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. For us who know you, bless us, Lord. Encourage our hearts. Speak to us through the precious word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at the fifth saying of our Lord Jesus Christ from the cross. It's found in John chapter 19 and in verse 28. John chapter 19 verse 28 which reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And it's especially that saying, I thirst. Now when you hear that, you might not think there's much to it. You might think that Jesus is just expressing his desire for a drink. But actually when you examine it, there is far more to it than meets the eye. There really is. This saying is very significant. It's very important. And it deserves our attention. And there is a lot here to explore. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it with three points. Number one, please look with me at the leading up to these words. The leading up. It's very important that we understand that phrase just before Jesus said, I thirst, that leading up. And then secondly, we shall consider the meaning of. What is the meaning of these words? The meaning of these words. What do they actually mean? If there's something more to it, and there is, what does Jesus actually mean when he says, I thirst? And then thirdly, the drawing from. What can we draw from Jesus' words? The lessons we can learn. So first of all, we consider the leading up. The leading up to these words. It's very important that we understand that before we actually look at the words, I thirst. Very important. Because John as he writes by the Holy Spirit, inspiring him. All the scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So John's writing down God's word, and he writes down an explanatory note before he says, I thirst. He doesn't just say, Jesus said, I thirst. John writes down something before that. Did you get it? At the beginning of verse 28. What does it say? After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. He puts that explanatory note in, which is very important. Very important indeed. What does that explanatory note say? It says, after this. Well, after what? Well, directly before that, the Lord Jesus Christ notices his mother there standing close by. And he notices the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John, who actually wrote this gospel. And he says to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Said to John, Behold your mother. Jesus cared for his mother, provided help, provided care. He had compassion, and we must have compassion. You and I must be compassionate. Jesus was, even at the cross where he died. We must have compassion. And it's these events directly after that that are now for our attention. He says, after this, after that great display of Jesus' compassion, after that, then what does it tell us? It tells us about Jesus' knowledge. Jesus knowing. Jesus perceived. Now, Jesus is fully God 
and he knows all things. He knew and he's fully man. But he's fully God. He knows all things. He's all knowing. And he knew. Well what did he know? What specifically does it tell us about Jesus' thoughts? After this Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. Well what are the all things? Because Jesus knew that all things were now accomplished. Well what are the all things? They're the all things about our salvation. Why did Jesus leave heaven and come down to this earth? Well, he was sent by God the Father. The Bible says the Father sent the Son as Saviour of the world. 1 John chapter 4 verse 14. The Father sent Jesus on a rescue mission to deliver us. To rescue us. To save us from this present evil age, it says in another part of the Bible. He came on a rescue mission. I'm, not, I'm sure you know about rescue missions, don't you? You know about the fantastic job that R and I do. And they go out in rough conditions to save people who are drowning. Perhaps their boats capsized and, and they get sent out, these volunteers... That just funded by donations. Wonderful work, isn't it? Great rescue or mountain rescues. Or, or firemen who, who come into burning buildings to rescue people inside. And rescue people. Deliver them. Draw them from, from their state of danger. And God the Father sent God the Son Jesus to rescue poor sinners like us. People have broken God's law. That's the all things. Jesus came down, born of a virgin, lived that wonderful life, died upon that cross in, a, in the sinner's place for every believer. That's the all things he's talking about. When all things were now accomplished, that's the great work he's involved in, isn't it? He's involved in that great work of delivering us from sins. That's why he's on the cross. He died for our sins. All things were now accomplished, were now completed, now came to their consummation, were now fulfilled. It's very similar to what Jesus is going to say, it is finished. More of that, God willing, next week. But now accomplished, it's fulfilled. And he knew that it would happen now. That's what he says. All things were now accomplished. Were now. Not before. Now. You see, there were different stages that Jesus went through. Came down to this earth. He was born. All throughout his life. He was fulfilling his father's will. And now he dies upon the cross and he bears our sin. All of these stages are so vital for our salvation. He wins our righteousness for us. And he, he dies upon the cross and takes his sin upon ourselves, upon himself. Our sin upon himself. He died for us. He bore all our sins in his own body on the tree. He fulfills, he satisfies divine justice. He dies in our place. And it was, if any of those things were not there, we couldn't be saved. If Jesus finished before all things were accomplished, we couldn't be saved. We couldn't be right before God. And so it was important that he went through everything when all things were now accomplished. Not before, but now. Everything's now finished. Everything's now accomplished. You know what it was in it and what it is in a far lesser sense. When we go through different stages of a task before it's accomplished, we go through those different stages and only when we go through those stages is that task finished. And it's only now that Jesus knows that all things are accomplished before they were not accomplished but now they are it's now he's finished it the end is inside the great the great work of salvation 
It's about to be accomplished. He says, all things were now accomplished. Then, that the scripture might be fulfilled. You know that the Bible is split into two. The Old Testament and the New Testament. What is the theme of the Old Testament? Answer, Jesus Christ. He's the big theme of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is pointing forward to Jesus Christ. It's telling us that there's a Messiah. He's on his way. He's on his way. He really is. That's what it says to us in the Old Testament. And Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. It points forward to Jesus. He's the theme of the Old Testament. And there are many, 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 many prophecies about Jesus Christ. Many. And he fulfills them. Every one of them. For example, there's a prophecy about where Jesus would be born. In Bethlehem. And Jesus is born in Bethlehem. All of them are fulfilled. For example, it was said that he would be betrayed. And he was betrayed. It says about how he will be, be betrayed by so many pieces of silver. And he was. Many, many, many prophecies about Jesus Christ. Many prophecies about Jesus Christ's cross. As we've seen, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When, he, when Jesus died upon the cross. And here's one of them. And Jesus knows, and it's amazing that he knows in his humanity, because he's in such pain, yet he's got clear thinking. And Jesus knows that one of them is not fulfilled. And it's about his thirst. And he said, I thirst. There are two places in the Psalms that talk about Christ the Messiah's thirst. The first one is in Psalm 22. Now Psalm 22 is a Messianic Psalm, particularly about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 verse 15 says this, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. My tongue clings to my jaws. Speaking about Jesus' thirst. He certainly got that in mind as he deals with Psalm 22 as he's on the cross. He's certainly, certainly an illusion there. And also, perhaps more clearly, in Psalm 69, which is another messianic psalm. It points forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 29, I'll read it from verse 20 to ascertain the context. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. It's clearly, although David's speaking in Psalm 69, it's about great David's greater son, the Lord Jesus. And it's about how when he's on the cross. And for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And that's exactly what happened. And Jesus knows about Psalm 69. And he knows that it's about him. And he says, I thirst. Because the scriptures are about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he fulfills them. Every one of them about himself. All the ones about the, the, the minutest details concerning the Lord Jesus' thirst. It's fulfilled. And he knows it and says, I thirst. Now, we must always bear in mind that the great theme of the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like, imagine you reading a biography. Have you ever read a really gripping biography? I'm sure you have. And it would be a tragedy, wouldn't it, to read the biography and to get so caught up with that person who is writing about, so caught up with their friends, so caught up with their associates, so caught up with some of the circumstances of their life, that they forget what the book is about. It's about that person. It's a biography of that person. And we can get so caught up in the Bible about all the incidentals, and we can forget what it's about. It's about Jesus Christ and the cross and saving us from our sins. So 
the leading up to these words. So important that we understand that. If we don't get John's explanatory note, we're not going to understand what Jesus means when he says, I thirst. There's more to it because of John's explanatory note. So secondly, the meaning of these words. We've looked at, haven't we, the leading up to these words. Now the meaning of these words. What does Jesus mean when he says, I thirst? What's he saying? Well, it does have a physical element to it. It does. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ has been on the cross a long time. He's been on the cross for six hours. Yes, granted that at noon till three o'clock in the afternoon, it was dark. But in the morning, Jesus had to endure the hot Middle Eastern morning sun beating down on him. That would have made him thirsty. Also, we read of nowhere that of Jesus having a drink after the upper room. The chances are Jesus didn't drink until the night before. Now, even if we're not in any sense of pain, I'm pretty sure that most of us don't go without a drink until three o'clock in the afternoon. You think about it. You drink, don't you? You don't leave it from the evening to the three o'clock the next afternoon before drinking, do you? Before drinking some liquid. And then think about this. Jesus is in great pain on the cross. I'm told that some people even died when they were of crucifixion. They even died when they were on the cross of thirst. It was that intense in crucifixion. Jesus' thirst was raging. His mouth was very parched. It wasn't just that he was a bit thirsty. His mouth would have been raging with thirst when he was on that cross. He was physically thirsty. And he cries out, I thirst. And we know that it has a physical element to it. Because just after that, we read verse 29. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop, that would have been on a branch, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. So we know that Jesus is thirsty because he actually received it. Now there's no contradiction because we do read in other accounts, for example in Mark, that Jesus rejected drink when it was offered to him. But there are two offerings. Because if you notice, that was at the beginning of the events of Calvary. For example, Mark 15, verse 23. He's offered a drink, but he rejects it. But he's offered another drink at near the end. And this time he accepts it. So there's no contradiction there. And he's offered this drink, and he accepts it. It would have been the cheap wine that the soldiers would have drank. There's a vessel there, and it's full of sour wine. It's sitting there. They get this sponge. They, they put it with sour wine, put it on his up on a branch, and they put it up to Jesus' mouth when he's on the cross, and he takes it. Has his thirst tiny bit quenched. He takes it, actually takes it. It shows that he was physically thirsty. Jesus Christ is fully God, yes, but in a way that is very mysterious and I don't understand, he's also fully man in one person. He has two natures, fully God, fully man, one person. And as a man, he felt every single last pain that he endured on the cross. He felt the lashings on his back, every last one of them. He felt the crown of thorns placed on his head. He felt the slap. He felt the beard being plucked out. He felt the pain of having to carry his cross. That's why Simon of Cyrene was compelled to carry it. He felt the pain as the nails were driven in. He felt every last pain, including thirst. He felt it. Jesus is human. And that is great for us because Jesus isn't aloof. And it means this. What does it mean? That when we have lesser sufferings, Jesus can truly empathise. We do not have a high priest 
who cannot sympathize with us in our weaknesses, the writer of the Hebrews says. He gives seed, aid to the seed of Abraham, it says again in Hebrews. He gives us aid. He's able to aid those attempted. In our lesser sufferings, far lesser sufferings, because the sufferings of Jesus, we do not know, we cannot tell what pain he had to bear. But we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. We don't understand the full extremity of Jesus' sufferings. Jesus suffered like no one did. But in our lesser sufferings, Jesus cares and Jesus sympathises. And this phrase can tell us that. I thirst. Jesus went through human sufferings as well. Also, he submitted himself to the Father's will. You see, when Jesus prayed just before he had the trial in Gethsemane, not my will but yours be done to the he his heavenly Father. A part of that submitting to the will of the Father was Jesus enduring this thirst. Having to go through it. It was a part of this submission that Jesus had to the Father's will. In fact, in the credible way he learned obedience by the things he suffered so when Jesus was on the cross he was submitting to the father's will even though it meant incredible intense raging thirst submitting to God's will does not mean that everything's going to be easy for us submitting to God's will doesn't mean that everything is going to be just hunky-dory, it's going to be full of roses, it's going to be like a walk through the park, it's going to be like a picnic in life, everything's going to be fine. It's not like that. We go through sufferings, and Christians are not immune from them. In fact, sometimes Christians suffer even worse than others, don't they? And it's a part of submitting to the Father's will, of in, in a far lesser way than what Jesus did. We must submit to the Father's will like Jesus. We must submit to what God wants for us, as hard as it is. And say, your will, Lord, not mine. Your will be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Submit to God's will. Even though it might be hard. It might very well be hard, but it's good to do it. In the 17th century, in France, there were the Huguenots that were incredibly persecuted. Incredibly persecuted. And there's a story of a young girl called Maria Durant. Maria Durant was 14 and she was hauled up and she was asked to recant. And she didn't do it. You think about it, a 14-year-old, life ahead of her. Obviously thinking perhaps about being a mother. Being a wife and a mother and, 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 and other things and having a nice life. 14. She's, all she could have done was just recanted, had a lovely life, no problem, but she didn't. And she was taken, this happened in the south of France, to a tower near the sea. And there with others, she wrote in French, resist resist on the wall. You can still see it today if you go there in Egg Trond. I think I've pronounced that rightly. Egg Nedmont in the south of France. Just, just east of Cacazone. Not that far. Maria Durant. She resisted the authorities because she submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. She submitted to God's will. And it was hard for her. In fact, she had to be in those conditions for 83 years of her life. She submitted to God's will, even though it's hard. And Jesus, it's being like Jesus, isn't it? We must submit to God's will, even though things are hard. There is a physical meaning, but there's more to it than that, as we say. There's a spiritual meaning, a physical and a spiritual meaning. Meaning, so when Jesus says, I thirst, there's more to it than just physical thirst. 
We know that because of the explanatory no. It's in the salvation context. So why does John say about how the scripture will be fulfilled and that all things will now be accomplished about his salvation work if it's just physical thirst? It's not a spiritual thirst as well. There is spiritual thirst. Jesus is thirsting for the souls of men. He's thirsting for people to be saved. To be right with him through what he did on the cross. He has this intense desire to see people saved. He does. He's, the work of salvation is about to be accomplished. He knows that all things are now accomplished. The scripture might be fulfilled. And he says, I thirst. I thirst. He's thirsting for souls to be saved. Wasn't that true of Jesus' life? You know, even when he was a young lad. And Mary and Joseph, they went off. And they, 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 they lost Jesus on the way. And they came back and he was in the temple. And, and Mary says, oh, don't you care? Oh, Father and I have been searching anxiously for you. And what does Jesus say? He says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He was thirsting for souls. When he said to fishermen, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you fishers of men. He was thirsting for souls. When he called out the disciples and sent them out to preach, he was thirsting for souls. When Jesus said, come to me, or you weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's he doing? He's thirsting for souls. When he looks at Jerusalem and he says, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to, how often I would have gathered your children as a hen gathers her chicks, but you are unwilling. What's he doing? He's thirsting for souls. What does he do when he rises again? That's, so before his life, before his death in life he thirsts for souls, and after his death he rises again. And he gives that great commission to his disciples. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He's thirsting for souls. And the, the apostles, they hand on the, the message to others, and they so on and so on and so on and so on. And Jesus makes sure that there are gospel preachers today. Why? Because Jesus is thirsting for souls. That's a spiritual meaning. I thirst. And we know that as well because it's a verb here in the Greek. It's a doing word. It's not an adjective. Jesus isn't describing an adjective. It's a describing word. Jesus isn't describing what's happening to him. And it's a verb, it's an indicative, it's a present, which means he's thirsty and he carries on thirsting. And it's in the active in the original, not the passive. It's not something that's just passively come on to him, this thirst. He's actively thirsting and therefore he's actively thirsting for souls to be saved. To come and enter into that salvation work. He says, I thirst. So we've seen, first of all, the leading up to these words. Secondly, we've seen the meaning of these words. Thirdly, the drawing from these words. What inferences can we draw? What can we deduce from these words? This saying. What can we deduce from it? What are the inferences? What are the lessons we can learn? There are many, by the way, we could learn. Many we could draw from. We could be here for a long time with him. I'll just draw out a few. If Jesus thirsts for souls, doesn't it tell us again something of Jesus' heart? Jesus has a large heart. Nobody has a larger heart than Christ. He has a warm heart for souls. I thirst for souls. He's got a heart for people. Jesus' heart is on display. Do you and I have a heart like the Lord Jesus? That's large, that's generous, that's not mean. It's not ill-spirited. It's not selfish. He's got a large heart for others. He's on the cross and he says, I thirst. He's thirsting. 
Do we have a large heart like the Lord Jesus Christ? Very important that we do. What else can we learn from this? If Jesus thirsts for souls to be saved, to be right with God, to have their sin forgiven and be right with God, then in a good sense, and I mean this in a good way, quench his thirst. Quench his thirst. If Jesus thirsts for souls, make sure that your soul is safe. There is nothing more precious than your soul. It will last eternally. Oh, make sure that you've come to the one who thirsts for souls. Because Jesus, who thirsts for others spiritually, that they would know him, is the one who is actually the fountain of life. Who's actually the fountain of living waters. The one who said, I thirst, is actually the fountain of living waters. Did you know that? Because we read of another time when Jesus was thirsty. He'd gone on a long journey. He sat by a well and there was a Samaritan and Jews and Samaritans. They didn't have any dealings with each other. Big no, no. But Jesus said to this woman, give me a drink. Did you know that we never read in John chapter 4 of Jesus ever getting his drink? He read through it. But he got more. He, had, he was thirsting for her soul. To be right with him. And it meant the whole village came to know Jesus. This woman who said, come tell it. Come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. It's great. Jesus said to this woman, if you knew who it was who said to you, give me a drink, you would ask of him and he would give you rivers of living water. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Shall well up within him. Fountains of living waters to eternal life. Friend, let me ask you. Have you had your spiritual soul and spiritual thirst quenched? Do you have spiritual thirst for your own soul? It can be met in Christ. In the Lord Jesus Christ. A few chapters on from John. In John chapter 7. Jesus stood at a Jewish feast. And on that last day. That great day of the feast. Jesus said. If anyone thirsts. Let him come to me. And drink. And out of his heart. Will flow rivers of living water. The one who said I thirst. Is the one who gives us living waters. Do you know right at the end of the Bible. In Revelation 22. It says, and the spirit and the bride say come, and let him who hears say come, and let him who thirsts come, and whoever desires let him take the water of life freely. Take the water of life freely. Take Christ. Satisfy you. To the Lord Jesus Christ. How everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you have no money. Come by any. Yes, come by wine and milk without money and without price, says Isaiah 55. Take of Jesus Christ. Take of him. Drink of him in your soul. He'll satisfy. Only Christ can satisfy, you know. Only Jesus can satisfy. What else can we learn? We can learn this. Is, does Jesus thirst for souls? Yes. Should you and I thirst for souls to be like Jesus? Yes. Maybe you are a believer. We ought to rekindle our efforts to thirst for souls to be saved like Christ. We want to be like the Lord Jesus all through his life and his death and his after he rose, before he ascended, he's got a thirst for souls. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you know what the Lord said to a prophet in the Old Testament called Ezekiel? In Ezekiel chapter 33, it says, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
but that he should turn from his way and live. Jesus doesn't have pleasure in people dying. Christ doesn't take pleasure in, in the death of the wicked. He doesn't rub his hands and, uh, and he's not vindictive. He's got no pleasure. He's got a wide heart. He thirsts for souls. And if Jesus does, we really ought to as well. Will I tell to sinners round what a dear saviour I have found. Let's pray earnestly for souls. Let's try and do what we can. Difficult now in the lockdown, appreciate that. But do what we can to tell people about Christ, to thirst for their souls, to want to see the Lord Jesus uplifted. Do you remember Rachel in the Old Testament when she didn't have children? She said to her husband Jacob, give me children or I die. What a lesson that is for us. We could use that as an illustration to say, give me souls, Lord. Thirst for souls to be right with him, with the Lord. Let's want to see people one for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've seen, I thirst. Do you see how this is more important than what first meets the eye? The leading up to these words, the meaning of these words, the drawing from these words. I hope you see the significance of this fifth saying of our Lord from the cross. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you. We worship you, O gracious God, for the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ said, on the cross, I thirst. We thank you, Lord, that he's human, went through human suffering, so that when we go through human suffering, Jesus sympathises. But Father, we thank you that he thirsted for the souls of men. Help us, Lord, to know Jesus' heart and help us to have the same heart as Jesus. Please be near us. We thank you for this saying. Oh, Father, give us much grace to love the Lord Jesus Christ and be near us. For we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. May the Lord greatly bless you.